for women that already own homes and they are a seller, they're more likely to give discounts to because they are willing to consider the buyer's issue. They're a little bit more compassionate. Um, you know, you know that, well, if we just write a letter to the seller the, and you ha they have five bids. They're probably going to like you because look at the story you've told them. Welcome to Give a Heck. I am your host, Dwight Heck, and for much of my life, lived my life in quiet desperation, wondering how I was going to pay the bills, take vacations, save for retirement, and one day wondering if I would get off the hamster wheel of life and have purpose. A life that most of society lives, which takes us to work, then home, then repeat, and pays us hopefully enough just to survive. The harsh truth that most live with more months than money and have no idea how to live life on purpose, not by accident. This ensures the mass majority are living not just financially broke, however emotionally and mentally as well due to financial pressures. In each episode, I will introduce you to thoughts, ideas, and guests that can help you to learn how you too can live life on purpose, not by accident. Good day and welcome to Give a Heck. On today's show, I welcome Rosemary Medell. Rosemary was raised by a single mom and experienced and observed the struggles that women encounter from financial instability. Then witnessed the courage it takes to develop resiliency in order to improve one's life. The desire to help women build their confidence, provide for their families and themselves has always motivated Rosemary. Rosemary offers women the opportunity to learn residential due to diligence to save time and money when purchasing their dream home. She combines real estate best practices with life experiences to offer her clients both real estate and life skills. She teaches her clients to become part of their city, have a voice in their community, which truly will empower women. Supplementing that expertise, she takes her coaching practice to an even greater supportive level through her certified high-performance coaching practice. I'd like to welcome you to the show, Rosemary. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and share with us some of your life journey. Dwight, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and chat with you on one of my favorite subjects, real estate and empowering women. Perfect. And as we talked about before I hit record, um, it's very near and dear to me, the empowerment of women, because of the fact that, you know, my loyal listeners already know that I have five kids, four of them are daughters, and just watching everything they've gone through throughout their lives from being, you know, my little girl where they're tugging on my arm saying, daddy, daddy, to being grown up adults and seeing throughout their lives, how they're mistreated and not giving respect. And, you know, honestly, as we also talked about, and my listeners have heard me talk about it before, we have national months for everything, but where's the national month or national year or national lifetime of women? Because really the most sensitive, most logical, most productive people in my life have been women. Yes, men, you hear it. <laughs> you heard it correctly, you know. I wouldn't be who I am today without my mom and dad, but my mom was the one that taught me to be resilient. She was the one that taught me to be kind. She was the one that taught me my faith. She was the one that taught me so much, but yet it was in the shadows. And that's so sad that it had to be in the shadows that she couldn't be a confident woman that she was with me privately out in the world today. And that's why I bring on people such as yourself. We need to continue to empower women and, and let them know how valuable they are to society. And that really at the end of the day, when they say that saying behind every good man is a good woman, that needs to change. Behind every good woman is a man wishing he was as good as a woman. Cause I, there's, you know, I'm not sitting here to cut down men, but I know myself, my daughters have taught me so much. And they continue to help me evolve and change because I'm open-minded. 
right? That's another thing. You got to be a person that's open-minded. So I'll get off my soapbox and we'll go on to the next part of the show. One of the things, as you know, we talked about, I focus on the origin story for somebody new listening to the show or watching on YouTube. The origin story is so important to connect with a person, to understand and know, like, and trust them is a person being vulnerable. So you can start as early as you want in your life, uh, be as vulnerable as you like, uh, pardon me, as you like, uh, this is a safe place for you. So do me a favor, Rosemary, and please share your origin story. Sure. Um, and, and yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, happy to hear that and that you are so enamored with women. We really appreciate that those have been out there in the jungle. Uh, as you read, you might, I come from a single mom who uh, raised us. There was five of us, uh, eventually six when she remarried, but my parents uh, divorced at 12 years old. So we were always struggled financially. My parents were both entrepreneurs. My mom owned a mom and pop grocery store in an area of Los Angeles called East LA. And my father went on to become an entrepreneur with a franchise fast food restaurants, but he was rarely in the picture. So we always were struggling. And I'm the second to the oldest of five kids. Uh, my, the oldest is a boy. So part of growing up was, um, and being a Latin family, we weren't allowed to go out in the neighborhood and play with other kids. There was enough of us that we could play at home. So playing with my brothers and being the second to the oldest, I learned to play basketball and football. And once in a while, I would box with them, you know, playing. Um, but I didn't like getting hit. I, I think um, all adults should experience that, to know that sting, and then you wouldn't hit a child or you wouldn't hit anyone unless it's actually for defense. But that experience of playing sports, which I love, I'm a major sports fan now, really builds that type of confidence in a girl especially because you learn to deal with men. You do not cower to someone who raises their voice. You can get in somebody's face if you can demonstrate that you're right, especially if there was a bad call that you got fouled in basketball and you didn't. We played against this one little boy in our neighborhood who was, I still remember his name, uh, Watanabe, David Watanabe. And he was a gymnast and he came over to our yard to play and we were playing basketball and we're, I went up for the ball for the rebound and knocked him out of the way. And this poor little guy gets up and he goes, my God, what do you feed her? She's just so, so assertive playing. I go, sorry, that's the game. Get, out, get the ball or get out of the way. And that attitude kind of has stood with me of you need to stand your ground. Um, so being that I... Uh, Financially, we couldn't envision that we could go to college. Uh, my senior year, our school was offering scholarships uh, that we could apply for to beauty school. Now, growing up with naturally curly hair in an era where everyone had long, straight hair, where I used to iron my own hair or straighten it, I go, you know, I could, I think I could do this. So I applied for this scholarship to this beauty school. And the day I graduate, my picture was in the paper with some other students. My brother goes, hey, Rose, you, you got a scholarship to go to this beauty school. I go, oh, okay, I guess that's where I'm going. And I started beauty school within, I think I got my license about a year and a half after I had started the program. And that experience of being in a salon, seeing women of all different economic backgrounds, of listening to their stories of going through divorce, of spouses dying, of lifestyle changes because the sudden changes in their life hit right at home because that was my experience as well. After four years of doing hair full time, I realized this is not enough for me. I am hearing all these stories, but I don't have the skill set to help them. I haven't lived enough life, even though I was married at 21. By 24, I was a mom. 25, had my first home. 
I still had so much more that I felt I needed to become. So I started college at the age of 27, thinking that, okay, I'm going to go into design. It was still something artistic. Uh, that was something I always enjoyed looking at homes, looking at model homes, especially. And in school, I realized that that's still another commission job, if you will, similar to hair. There was no guaranteed income. I could not really control it as much unless I was really going to work, you know, 24 seven. So I applied to a, and I started off in community college and community college at that time was free to go to. You just had to purchase your books. And I remember speaking to their clerical staff and asked, you could come here and become whatever you want and it's free. Are you kidding me? Why aren't all these kids in here? You have an opportunity to change your life. You have to put in the work. You have to go to class, but it's free. So after a few years, I applied to go to a university, which was an impacted program. And I got in. It was like a scene out of the movie Rudy where he is waiting to get into Notre Dame and he kept getting rejected. I wasn't getting rejected, but that was my first attempt to think I can be more than where I'm at. And I got in and I knew exactly how he felt to get received that letter. It's like, it was awesome. Although now my ex-husband had asked, so what was the best day of your life? And, and it can't be when your children were born. Okay. And I said, well, when I got into the university and his response was, well, mine was when we got married. I go, oh man, I missed that one. I was being honest. It's like, you don't understand for someone, for this kid who grew up in East LA and to now by effort and willpower get into this university, that was life-changing for me. And I would advise anyone, if you're able to get a scholarship, take advantage of it. Because I was a hairstylist and I was going to school and remained a hairstylist. And it took me 11 consecutive years to graduate. But I graduated with no student debt. And I was able to literally change my life and I became an urban planner and from that point I recalling everything I learned in the salon which is all about customer service gaining someone's trust cutting their hair that could really change how they feel about themselves and now taking that skill set to the public counter helping individuals try to get through construction, trying to ask questions of what they can and can't do. All of that has never been wasted. And so 30 years later, being an urban planner, tons and hours and hours of writing and public hearings and speaking to women whose husband have died during the middle of a construction project, or trying to start a business and not understanding what they should be looking at in a commercial site or industrial site. I started to see there's a, a gap here. There's something that they are missing. Now, for a short time, I also became a development consultant in LA where people would hire our firm to conduct their due diligence. This is the 1% very high end, the mansions, but there was also that gap. And lo and behold, 2020, Yale comes out with a study confirming my assumptions of just working the public counter that women are paying 2% more than men in a real estate transaction. And they're not attributing it to the lack of negotiation skills, but rather all these other factors of women wanting to look at a property because there's a short time frame to get their kids in school or wanting a particular school district or the commute to their jobs 
all these other factors. But I see it from the professional experience is that women don't know how to determine value of a property because they don't know how to follow up on their due diligence. So in California, you have, if you enter into a contract to purchase a property, you have 17 days to conduct your due diligence, or you need to request it go beyond that. But there has to be a good reason because both parties have to agree to that extension. And you're getting disclosures. You're being told, you know, what the zoning is. Great. Well, what does that mean? You're being told if you're in a flood zone, okay, what are the impacts of that? Or you're going to need fire insurance or there's an easement on your property. All of that is not the job of your realtor to find out all the answers. Their job is to advise you to look for the answers. So where do you go for that? Well, you have to go to city hall or you have to go to your county building. And no one would know how to do that unless you're going every single day, asking the question at a time and trying to figure it out. But every time you go in there, you're probably taking time off of work. And there's a dollar value associated with your time off. Even if you, if you could take the time off, there could be instances where, no, you're not allowed to. You know, you know it's just too expensive to lose those hours of work. So I'm looking at, all right, how could I create something that will help women? And of course, I help men as well learn this process. I have a son. Of course, I'd want to help a man do this as well and conduct their due diligence. But hopefully when you do learn this process, you're sharing it with another woman. You're sharing it with your daughter. You are, you're learning to ask the appropriate questions. You're learning to either proceed with the deal or to walk away from the table because the risk that you're taking is just too high. You can't verify permits. You're paying for a square footage that has not been verified. You are not sure if the easement that you can build a pool next to it or a guest house or all these other factors that you've now learned. And once you do that, once you have done your homework and now you proceed with your deal, and I want to live here and I have all these checks of why I want to live here, then I want you to become involved in your community because now you are truly invested in your city. And what you see around speaks to the values of the city, of the community. And your involvement is critical to the success, the continued success of that city, that you have a voice and that female perspective is critical in the growth of a city in how young people are going to enjoy it, your children are going to enjoy it, you at every stage of life as a senior, the walkability, the safety, all these things are a part of you being involved and truly wanting to live in a particular city or community. Wow. So that's my two cents. <laughs> that's amazing. We're going to dial it back though, to some of the things you talked about in your origin, because it's, you talked about the fact, you know, playing sports, and, you know, people don't like, you know, I think about bullies mm. and you hear, you hear the stories of bullies that finally somebody that's getting bullied stands up and hits them. And that bully all of a sudden stops being a bully to anybody because, and it, it, I don't know why it popped into my head because they've never felt being hit. And you're right. Uh, maybe if they had felt being hit, maybe they would have never been a bully because they would have known what it was like themselves. Yeah. The pain, the pain principle of even people in business, like being willing to step outside of their comfort zone and actually feel the pain and the angst and the quiet desperation would maybe make them appreciate things a lot differently and see the world differently. Right. But they, they just don't. So I really liked you bringing that up. And I, and I thought again about bullies, you know, now it makes sense when a bully gets hit a lot of times they back down and they stop being bullies. And they're and they cower from the person that hit them because they'd never been hit before, right? 
sometimes bullies, oh, it's because they're bullied at home and they're abused, obviously, right? But there is circumstances where, you know, they stop being a bully because they'd never ever realized what it was like to to get happened to them, what they were doing to others. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And you talked about salon stories and women talking to you. And I wrote down here, who is listening? And then you mentioned further into the story about a listening gap. Well, bottom line, even in my industry, when people are communicating with me, I'll tell people it's like you going to a salon or dealing in a in a little pub and you're talking to the bartender because somebody's listening to you it, with no judgment. And sometimes you figure out your own solutions and your own answers, or you figure out what you need to do next, just because somebody's willing to let you talk and willing to let you, you know, and listen. So I thought that was really good of you to share that too. Um, I can't imagine what you had to experience, you know, working in that salon, you were only there a few years, you mentioned, but you, it certainly made you realize what was going on out in the world, right? That people were suffering, specifically women, right? And you mentioned as well, getting a haircut. I've heard that from so many women. I've seen that with my mom or my sisters or even my daughters, that a simple haircut makes them have a spring in their step, right? Well, it's interesting. It's that human connection, right? When someone puts their hands on you, when someone touches your hair, that, that they become vulnerable, but you have to gain their trust right away. And you have to listen. Hopefully you're listening to what they want to ultimately look like. But in the salon, that's, there's never been a job that I've laughed so much as it was just delightful hearing these stories and then sad hearing stories. I was so naive. One of the stylists I worked with, I was just sharing this story that she was an abused woman. And I had never seen a woman with bruises on her face. And she came to work and I asked, oh, what happened to you? And she said, well, I fell and hit the coffee table. And I just kind of accepted it. But the other stylists were kind of just laughing a bit. And then I felt, well, okay, this, this isn't right. But I had never experienced that, you know, to see a woman that was physically abused. And so it was that learning experience. Uh, at that time, the stylists were all older than me. And lived a pretty conservative, sheltered life, um, being at home, not being able to go out into the world other than working, worked in the sewing factory. You know, once I got out of high school for a bit before I became a hairstylist and just seeing what women went through to try to survive and how hard they were working for very little money. And to realize that you do have a choice. There's a price to pay for that. And that price is lack of sleep. You know, working hard. Uh, I'd get home from school or from being a hairstylist, make sure I had dinner ready, serve everybody and get to class by seven. And I didn't have time to eat. Uh, but I wasn't the only one going through that. I was seeing other women in my classes who had more children than me and they were doing it as well, but they had a desire to improve themselves. They had a vision of this is what I have to do to become the person I need to become. And that in itself to see that we're all in the same boat here, but where is your journey going to take you? And you hope that they don't quit because it'll be worth it. Because the most important thing is that your children see that you are a happy, fulfilled mom, right? And they see your journey. My daughter still remembers drawing with me because I had art projects from my architectural class. And she goes, I remember that drawing. I remember drawing with you for like three hours. And that's what she recalls. It's like, yeah, that's the example that you're setting for your children. Do not think that they're not observing you. Oh, they observe they everything. 
they yes. observe everything and we need to role model the positive behavior like you you were married at 21 mom by 24 home by 25 went back to school at 27 the the theme there is you're tenacious and i talk about that oh, on my podcasts <laughs> right tenacity is a superpower and you can uh, you can learn it's a learned behavior that you can become tenacious understand your why what do you want it doesn't mean just because i hear from so many people over my lifetime well especially women obviously oh i'm married now i got kids i can't go back to school absolutely you can go back to school and yes. you know great role modeling that people are listening to that up uh, your life right you decided you didn't you never ever just settled settling now i don't want people to think that settling can be bad so if you're if you're a woman or a man and you're in a life that you like and you're you're just coasting along good for you but for some people that's just not enough they need more out of life they don't want to be continually subjugated by society and put in their place this is your place rosemary you better not go outside of these these walls you better not better yourself and having a spouse whether it's male or female supporting us is important but it is not as important as you believing in yourself and you believed in yourself and look where you are today and look at what you're doing to help people. You're helping people, specifically women, be able to purchase this home and not have that 2% disparity. Like that's just, that's horrible. And originally I wrote down here, is it because of the, the realtors, but you answered that question. That's not really their their job it's their job is just to try to sell something but i still can't see though that it wouldn't be somewhat the realty industry taking advantage because even if you get all these uh you know due diligence you get the disclosures and you understand that and you have somebody why is two percent because the realtor is laying down the price for you you're bickering back and forth why is that two percent disparity not on the shoulders of a realtor taking advantage. Like I, I can't see that 2% being part of the due diligence or disclosure. Can you explain where that 2% is coming from? Like it has to originate somewhere. Well, it's a variety of factors, right? They are willing to pay more, especially in the California market for the past few years, there was such a shortage and the entire nation is seeing this shortage of inventory. So they are paying full price or above that. And when you start doing that, then you really need to protect that investment. And that's where that due diligence part comes in. But if they are stating that, well, I need to be in this school district, I'm going to not get that home inspection because I want to make sure this deal closes. Uh, whereas a their male counterpart will negotiate better because they do not have that attachment to a particular district. They're more concerned with the numbers, right? I can walk away from this deal. I can get a fixer upper. I don't need this to be in the particular area. We're also, the National Association of Realtors has also disclosed that people are driving further from their point of uh, work. So it's gone up 15 miles even more. So now the range is at 50 miles. But for a single mom, 50 miles to be away from your work and you need to go pick up your child because they're sick at school is a long way. So to get you closer to work, you are more likely to not follow through with some of the disclosures. You are going to pay full price or more because you need to be within a particular location. So we know in real estate, it's all about location, but it's location even more so for moms, right? You need to be by your support system, family. You need to be by work. You need to have a safer environment for your children. All those factors, or you're not going to, you'll take more risk because your due diligence has shows that, well, that HVAC system is the original and this house is, you know, 38 years old. Uh, it may give out, but I'm not going to repair it. So you need to accept it like this. Um, but, you know, you have your other, your checklist that you're going, well, I really need this school district. 
I need to have my child in school by August. And so all these things you start to let go of, you start to lose that negotiation power because of the things that you need. And that's where they start, this study starts to show this. The other side of it is for women that already own homes and they are a seller, they're more likely to give discounts to because they are willing to consider the buyer's issue. They're a little bit more compassionate. Um, you know, you know that, well, if we just write a letter to the seller the, and you ha they have five bids. They're probably going to like you because look at the story you've told them. Whereas the male counterpart is like, can they close on time? Am I getting my price? You know, I don't care if it's one person or a family of 10. Here's the deal, <laughs> right? There is, that is not as much a consideration as it is with the female buyer. Well, the men are more emotionally disconnected. Let's, it's, it's the truth. You know, obviously I'm a little bit more emotionally connected because of my mom, my two sisters, my five, my five kids, four being daughters. It's been, you learn to develop, you learn to change your, you know, stick to itiveness of being a certain way and being rigid and, and being more connected. So it makes sense that they would want to be more compassionate because what happens if it's another woman that's buying the home? So they want to give them a discount where, like you said, the guy's just going to be like, this is the price, either buy it or get lost, <laughs> piss off. I don't care if it's who's living here. So the disparity between men and women is definitely an emotional connection and being able to um, be empathetic. I think empathy is a thing that men need to work on. All right. I, myself, I guess I had in a podcast, the person I met at a conference is an empath coach. And she helped me understand that part of the problem and part of the pro of being who I am is that I'm an empath. I didn't realize that I picked up, I was always tired all the time because I had four daughters and I was like the antenna picking up all their stuff, but it also made me a better person. It made me be more understanding. Initially, was I perfect? No, I'd be that grumpy guy saying the wrong thing and, and going and, and I'm not apologizing to the guy that was apologizing, being more emotionally connected and realizing that I had to evolve and I think today's men need to learn how to evolve so that that circumstances you're talking about change and shift. And they're never going to change or shift unless they hear your story or me talking about it. So people listening to this, share this with other people so that they understand the disparity of what's going on with women dealing in the real estate market in conditions where they need their home to be close by to extracurricular, to schools and their their job and be compassionate don't be a jerk <laughs> right <laughs> so you know you talked about so many different things throughout this journey that you've been on and you, you know you talked also about you know urban planning and and how does that tie in talk more about the urban planning aspect of in real estate and how you've been able to help people through that journey. Sure. Urban planning is all about the development of cities. Uh, they decide where particular types of businesses uses, if you will, are going to be located. That's the big picture of it. And when you start to look at a property, you start to look at a neighborhood, but you, then you start to look at, well, what is it adjacent to? The urban planning, you're also looking at what amenities does this particular city have to offer? That's part of the property taxes are going to go into those amenities, roads, parks, um, recreational facilities that are open to its citizens, uh, schools, all these things are all part of it. But if you're in a large city where there's tourism, then you're also looking at that. In California, we are so close together, all the cities, you don't even know where one starts and the other one ends. And But there are destination cities, anything on the beach, uh, mountains, all these. And to get to them is all part of the urban planning process. 
we have huge freeway systems. That's all part of getting from one locale to the other. Urban planners look at the impacts of those, especially in California, our environmental process. We start to look at the impacts of noise, of pollution, of traffic, and how that impacts communities. And now when you purchase property, you start to, it has its walkability rating. So you start to see, well, you know, could I, if I purchased in a particular area, walk to its downtown? Could I walk to services? All those things start to reduce you needing to get in your vehicle. Now in the urban areas, some people are looking at just public transportation. So you don't need to use your car, especially with our gas prices in California are so high. That's, that's really a big factor. Uh, so that's where urban planners start to implement the policies of the decision makers uh, that are influenced by their constituents, by their citizens of this is what we want. Uh, it still needs to be evaluated by the state for the big picture of how cities could grow, should grow, what are the values reflected in particular cities, and then the values of its citizens. So that's where the urban planning comes in. But that's where it's difficult for someone who's also looking at a property to factor in to that. It's like, well, why should I go to City Hall? What questions should I be asking? I'd love this house. The location seems to be fine. But what am I missing? What do I need to know by from your expertise, from both sides of the counter, from being on the government side and then being on the realtor developer side? How can you teach me in the shortest period of time that in a manner that I could understand that impacts me immediately? So we know that growing your real estate portfolio is all about creating generational wealth. And once you've done that, you start to build that confidence. And if you choose to be get married, then you know while you have this asset that you could have as your sole and separate property, and it doesn't have to be something that you could lose in a divorce, but uh, that in itself takes some courage to be honest enough with someone to say, I'd love you, I'd love to get married, but uh, let's speak about the finance part of it. This is mine and that's yours and we'll create an ours, but uh, this is the reality. I love uh, that. Uh, <laughs> so many people don't think of that though. And you hear about prenups and you hear about, especially because of celebrities, you hear it on such yeah. a grandiose scale. And at the end of the day, just because you marry somebody doesn't mean you marry their assets. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like even me as a divorced man, if I ever decide to remarry, that's going to be part of the conversation. You have yours. I have mine. Well, then we'll have our ours. And it, it, mine is going to my kids, my grandkids. That's just, it is what it is. Anything we have yep. ours will be ours, right? Something happens and I pass away or you, you know, we don't survive. That's what it should be. But so many people, I guess that term, what do they call it? Gold diggers. <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying women are there. I know men that are like that too, that have married into money and they expect to be kept. Right. And it's go on your own, <laughs> go do your own. I've had to sacrifice so many years to get what I have. Like you said, that house, and this will be ours, but this is mine. Something happens well, <laughs> to me, this goes to my kids or it's generational or whatever the case may be. I used to conduct an intern program at this, one of the cities I used to work for. And I tell my interns, there's three things. And, and the ones that went on to become urban planners, they still laugh and they say, I remember that talk you had. I go, okay. And it was, don't become a planner because of the politics and dealing with the public. But if you wanna become a planner, I'll help you. See the world, because that's gonna make you a more compassionate person and you need to understand how other cities operate and then get a prenup. And I said, well, here you are, you wanna become a young professional, you're going to move on in your career. Eventually you're going to get some assets, you're building up a retirement. And now you're going to get married and you're going to lose 50% of everything that you've developed. How does that make you feel? So um, 
yeah, they all remembered that advice. Well, especially in California, because you're a 50% state, right? Yes. So, and I laugh at all these, I hear it even in my country, people getting split up and they're going to go to court and fight the prenup. And thank goodness the legal system, especially in California, I just read an article. I don't know why this even came up in my feed. And I read it a couple of days ago where a judge basically said, upheld the prenup and said, sorry, you signed it in good faith. This all happened prior to you guys getting married. And yes. You were in the prenup, you agreed to this amount of money if things didn't work out and you agreed to this amount of support if there was, if their kids were still younger, you agreed to all this stuff and now you want like two, four, five, six times the amount. And the judge basically said, nope, sorry, right? It was your choice to go rent this house for this amount of money. This was your choice to do all this stuff after the fact. It was your choice to challenge all this stuff. And on top of that, you want them to pay your legal bills? No, that's not going to happen. I was just like, I'm reading this article going, you know, sometimes the legal system can work. Sometimes it can. <laughs> yeah. I know it's few and far between, but, you know, sometimes <laughs> it can actually work. Um, what is, you know, I don't know why this popped into my head. Because you we talk about urban urban planning. What is your definition of urban sprawl? We always hear people talking about that we have urban sprawl going on in communities as they grow. Do you could you share about that or your knowledge involving sure. what well, urban sprawl it, it is? It really is because they can't live uh, in the central part of the city or its periphery, right? Still within the city limits. So you start to have developments that are if you will, in the county areas or in other cities adjacent to the primary source of the job markets. So that is where to create more affordability, developments start to occur, occur further away from the primary hub of employment. Oh, okay. So in LA, everyone, again, as I had said, you know, they're commuting 50 miles or so that's so in horrible. LA, because of our traffic, 50 oh, mile that's... commute could be three hours, hours easily. Oh, I can't um... imagine. I can't imagine. <laughs> right. And I've been, st I've been stuck on some of the freeways in LA and, and it wasn't even rush hour. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is a crawl. Come look in my city. I can go from one end of the city to the other. You can go around our whole city. We have a, a, a ring row that goes around it takes an hour to go around the whole city, wow. right? <laughs> then again, one and a half million people, right? So yeah, it's it's interesting. So that urban sprawl happens and they move to have cheaper housing and cheaper maybe cost of living, but really is their cost of living higher or lower? Because now all of a sudden they have to drive to their employment, that 50 miles, they're spending more yes. gas. As you mentioned, the cost of gas is so high and actually... Just as a side note, gas costs more here than you pay in California. I know this for a fact. Oh, we, good. We We're pay, happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, we, we pay more per gallon, which we go by liter, but we pay more per, yeah. per gallon. Um, our gas right now is around $6 a gallon. Oh, okay. We're, a gallon. we're headed upward of that. Yeah. yeah. You're, uh, you're upwards of that now? Yes. Yep. Wow. Like yeah. I thought, because at one time you guys were way lower than we were. Oh, quite no. a bit. No, we're over six dollars. Oh, really? I think I think when I figured it out the other day, based on the gallon and liter conversion, we were around six eighty. I think it was. Ooh, okay. So yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. and so, that's the importance of transportation, alternative forms of transportation. But right? who pays the for the system, the But who pays for the alternative bus systems though? Well, that's a broke a broken tax a broken tax system. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not in California. Maybe you guys got it all figured out. <laughs> oh, you betcha. <laughs> we we have we have an uh, expansion of our light rail transit system here. There and from our area to the downtown, it's only so now I got to convert this. Let's say it's uh, about eight ten miles, and one point seven billion dollars. It's still not up and running, and they started it in twenty sixteen. All right, it's just like. <laughs> Ah, you know how many buses you could have bought? How many people you could have employed? You know how many, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I mean by broken tax systems and overspending, government government overspending, gov not enough good urban planning, 
And the reason I bring that up is well, because- Well, they prioritize their workforce, oh right? My... On particular projects. So well, where are they going? <laughs> yeah, let's see. 20% of our population works in downtown and you're spending all the trains that are they're building are going into the downtown core. Very inefficient spending of money based on what taxes are brought in, based on the fact that a majority of the people in our city going into the downtown core to work want to avoid paying for parking. So it's cheaper for them to pay for parking at a, a light rail transit or what we call RT station, pay a, a yeah. monthly fee to get on the train and go into the downtown than it is for them to park downtown and the congestion and all the crap to get into the downtown core because our see how downtown important is, it is that you get involved. You should be urban planning. <laughs> urban planning sucks here. And anybody listening well, in our city that's government, planning. well, they well, don't look at the, the that's the traffic commissioner, transportation yes, yes, commission. Yes, yes, So you they, could just be involved in that without being an urban planner. Oh you my could gosh, bring your they perspective. <laughs> I have brought my perspective. I've been vo very vocal in our city awesome. and it just falls in deaf ears. <laughs> so <laughs> you get to a point where it's just like, I, I'm a squeaky wheel. You give me some oil because you say you're going to do something and something's going to change. And then the next person gets into power as a mayor and the alderman and you guys still screw up and you're taking advice. They don't even utilize in our city. A lot of it's farmed out. They contract it out to other firms now. Yes. And it's it's based on a cost structure. So you're not necessarily always getting the best for the value. And the lowest bidder. Yes, the lowest bidder. And oh my gosh, our LRT is a prime example. 1.7 billion and it's still not operating. And they're literally the way they built it, just as a side note, it takes, it, you could get in your car and drive downtown Edmonton in 25 minutes. If getting on LRT from here to go downtown because of all the stops they've added is 45 minutes. So- <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on with this conversation. I love it. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, people fall in love with that facade. And this is back to that home inspection thing. So, so many pe people will look at a house and they fall in love with the facade of the house. And they really don't, or because maybe it's close to the school, maybe it's close to this or that. And they forgo getting a home inspection. And it can... I've had clients, it's literally cost them thousands, if not tens of thousands. It's staggering because they they buckle and they want that home so bad that they don't put in that contingent that they have to have a passable home inspection. Besides the fact of what you said about home inspection and why they don't do it because of the schools and stuff, what else is what what else is the issue besides that? Do you find any other issues besides the fact of why people don't get home inspections? Do they not see value in it with the people that you've dealt with? Well, part of the it's the emotion of getting that house that you like. You know, that's one of the biggest mistakes people make is they fall in love with the curb appeal. They yeah, fall in so. love with the interior decor because right before they're gonna list it, they could be painting it. And they bring in a home stager and it all looks wonderful. But you need to rely on someone who's not emotionally attached to the product. And you get that home inspector. Now, when there were lots of bids, one of the negotiating deal was I'll forego the home inspection and we'll close this thing sooner. Well, it works if you're paying all cash, uh, but you still your lender may require that there is a passable home inspection, or you could find out later that you are purchased this three bedroom, four bath with this addition that was done. And you didn't verify that that addition was done with permits, even though it looks beautiful. So a neighbor could say, well, after you take ownership, you know, that wasn't done with permits. Let me go to the city and complain. Then the building department could come in require an after the fact permit. And if it was not done properly, constructed properly, or if it exceeded the development standards, it could be demoed. And you've just paid for something that's going to be reduced in square footage. So a home inspection starts to reduce your level of risk that you're willing to take. Now, if you were paying a substantial amount less, you could do that and 
say, okay, I can take a financial loss because of the location. I can rebuild, no big deal. But if you're a female buying this, you've saved years to have your down payment and you can afford the mortgage, but not more than that because you don't have $100,000 to take any financial risk, then you've put yourself in financial jeopardy. And that's where you need to protect yourself. You need to understand and verify everything that you're seeing. And hopefully the seller is working in integrity and you have a great realtor that's also advising you because they don't merely handle the transaction. They are have a fiduciary responsibility to serve you, to represent you. And so hopefully you found someone that is going to do that and you work alongside your realtor. Now for the realtor side, you know, I hear that um, they're concerned with the market that these major online companies are taking away a lot of business. So what do you do then? You improve your customer service. And part of improving customer service is now accompanying your client to City Hall. And you're not finding the answers, but you are advising them as you get the information from the city should we proceed with this deal or not? This is my professional opinion. The choice is still ultimately yours if you want to move forward. But if we want to walk away, we'll find another one. It may be too risky for you. And that's where you start to collaborate with your client and gain that future business from them or referrals from your client because you did such a professional job. And that's, you know, that works in so many different industries. Even in my industry, people are, you, you talked about online sales, or you've got these realty companies that you post, you know, you pay a set fee and it includes the legal and you put the sign on the lawn and, and, you know, now that now you can pay an extra fee. So it still goes into MLS listing and blah, 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 but they're missing all that service factor. And I have quite a few friends that are realtors. One that I grew up with um, throughout my childhood into adulthood and you know i hear the stories and and you know there people are worried about that he says i'm not worried about it i give good service and I, they tell other people and all it takes is one person within that circle of a community uh, like he lives in a small community outside of the city where they try those services and they have and the disdain or or they get caught with stuff to, like a disclosure missed or they get caught with the fact of bad inspection or no inspection and all it does is strengthen my business maybe it temporarily is a hiccup for one person or a group of their friends but once one of them gets burned they tell all the other people and it comes back and my business just gets strengthened so he's not worried about the online stuff, because he gives, like you said, give that service. Well, my industry is the same thing. Oh, robo advisors and blah, blah, blah. We got all these different online brokerages and online people doing, you know, financial planning. And we got all, all these people doing, you know, you can type all this in and it tells you what to do and you don't need to talk to anybody. You don't waste any time. And it's just, it's get right to the point. In my industry, more and more people want that relationship factor. They want me to be that person, like you're talking about, standing beside their side, giving them that support, giving them that, you know, this could go on or this could go on. That's ultimately your choice, but here is my professional opinion. So I love how you brought that up. People listening or people watching, you know what? nobody's going to replace the human condition, the human relationship of somebody that's good, that's compassionate and caring, that listens to your concerns, that takes you, as you mentioned, maybe you have to be that person going to city hall. Maybe you have to be that person talking, you know, to the spouse or significant other saying, you know what, you really should do this inspection, you know, as your realtor, this is why you should do it. Or me, you should really be doing this budget and understanding your numbers so that you can live a purposeful life. Nothing can replace us, in my opinion. I totally agree. You know, people have to decide what do you want? What level of risk do you want to assume? And you need to bring on the experts. You need to know when to bring on the experts because you think you're investing in that now or paying for that service now, but an error will cost you so much more. 
It, it certainly will. And I look at that myself, like I've had clients that have left me to literally save a half percent in management fees, which I'm not the person that sets the fee. It's the, it's the fund companies that I'm dealing with that set the fee. They'll leave to go to some place where they're saving a half percent. I've had people move millions of dollars over a half percent out of a structured financial roadmap plan that was working for them, was giving them great rates of return. But somebody came to them, right? And said, oh, come come to us. We'll save you a half percent. And over a lifetime, it magnifies for this. And in some clients will reach out to me and tell me, and we'll, we'll have a discussion. I'll say, well, for that half percent, do they give you this, 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 and that? And more importantly, do you have me? Do you have me with my 20 some years of experience supporting you along with the back end of the people that support me? Is it really worth that half percent? And some will go, well, you know, you're, you're right. Right. And then other ones will just, all of a sudden I get a notice that they're moving their assets and I'll reach out to them saying, what are you doing? Well, we're going to save a half percent, right. Or 1%. Oh, and they'll also pass it on to my children when, when they're ready to come to you. I, Okay, but what are they passing on? What do you, what value are you getting? People devalue what we do or what we can do to help you over, and I'm serious, over a half percent. It's just asinine. I don't, I don't get that. You know, <laughs> if you're talking on a million dollars at a half percent, yeah, it's a little bit of money, but what are you getting for that half percent? And people don't see the forest for the trees. And it's unfortunate, but I, I've lost clients over the year, like I said, that over a half percentage just, and I, and some of them, I actually know what's going on in their lives because I have other clients that are related to them or friends with them that stayed with me that didn't drink the Kool-Aid like they did, they did for a half percent and they're not doing as well as they were doing because they lost that support. It was just a transactional, not a relationship business, right? Not a relationship. Right. Right? And, and someone that's that truly I, cares. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're here, we're here to serve. My life will not change if you go away. I'll be hurt to see that you didn't trust the process. Oh. That you were just went to the next shiny object and like got yeah. into someone's delusions of what could potentially happen. But you're the one that has taken all the risk from someone who really doesn't know you, who's not vested in your interest. And it's right. never too, it's never too late. Like I, uh, I, I recently dealt with a, a teacher that I've known for years, met her. She was in, in a min in, in a brokerage, uh, an agency that I was running my brokerage out of. She was in a min person for another office. We became friends. Now, 18 years later, she reaches out to me and says, you know, are you still in the business? And I said, absolutely. Cause I'd left that place 17 years ago and she said to me well she says I really need some help and some support and I, you know I'm not where I think I need to be and I said well okay let's let's jump on a call we're not going to talk nothing about products we're not going to talk about services we're, we're just going to have a conversation and see where you're at see where your money or your money monster is currently and we had this conversation and the people that she had been dealing with had shuffled her around to different agents. She had gone between one, one situation to another. Nobody asked her what she really wanted. Nobody asked her what her desires were today, what her desires were for long term. You know, and I literally spent before we there was actually a transaction that occurred between her and I, I had spent 12 hours with her. The first call alone, which normally I, I'll set aside two to three hours because mm -hmm. she lives not close to my community. So a lot of, I do a lot of stuff on Zoom now because you can you can be effective over Zoom. You don't need to drive to see people if you're a good person, know how to communicate. And it was five hours, the first call, just wow. dealing with her, just helping her understand her options and choices. And I remember her telling me, I've never had like, wow, this is not what I expected. Even though I worked in that office where you were at and seen the successes of what you were developing for processes, I didn't realize that it was like this, that it was flowing like this. I said, well, all I've done was adapt and better. I've had a betterment process where I've gotten better at doing it. I've become a better relationship person since you knew me. So it's the same process. It's just gotten more efficient. 
So, you know, 12 hours till a transaction occurred. How many transactional people are out there in my industry that just do it like this? There's no connection. There's lots of people in real estate that do that too. Yes. Whether there's a, because I have a, I have, I have a fiduciary duty, just like a realtor. Doesn't matter. Doesn't mean just because, just because there's rules doesn't mean people are <laughs> following them. And for those watching, you see me, those last thing I did air quotes <laughs> when I said rules, right? So, um, so one of the things that I, you know, you've heard this before and you recommend once a person purchases a home, they get involved in their city. Can you dial in a little bit more about that? What, what exactly that entails and why it's betterment for them and for the city itself? Sure. There's just to become part of the community to know how can I offer my expertise or how can I learn something that is of interest to me? Parks and recreation, transportation. Uh, I'm seeing new development occur. What's that all about? Um, are there senior citizens groups that I could bring my expertise to or just be a part of that? So you wonder, okay, well, where do I even start? So in California, you actually go to the city and you speak to the city clerk. And the city clerk is the individual who keeps record of all everything that occurs in the city, all notices, uh, hearing, uh, public hearing notes. They are a critical part of the record keeping of a city. So you could ask, can you place me on your mailing list of any volunteer opportunities that come up. And as these things occur, let me know. It'll state what type of expertise you need, if any, uh, when do people meet, who would the selection process be? And you can start to see that way. Okay, I can now feel really a part of this community and contribute uh, my expertise or just learn something new and see who lives here, um, make new friends, uh, take that pride in your investment. Women tend to keep properties uh, longer than men, especially if they're parents, uh, because they want their children to grow up in a community and who better to know the direction that it's going than someone who is involved, if you're able to. Certainly, if you're a single mom and you're raising five kids and you know it's kind of hard to also be involved, but there could be other ways that you can. Uh, certainly Zoom has changed things. So meetings that are happening that way, um, you just contributing through the form of a letter or a call just to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on in your city will really make you feel that you've made that a good investment and that will retain you as a citizen in their community. That's, that's excellent advice. Um, I know one of the things that I, I'm gonna start looking into, somebody recommended is a, a thing called meetups. They mm -hmm. have them in your local, I don't know if you've had experience with that. Yes. And it's a great way as well, they say, to find your local groups that are getting together and finding out exactly what they stand for membership numbers and then you can apply and become part of that organization so I know I had that recommended to me here recently because obviously my kids are growing up grandkids I want to spend more time within the community um, instead of always searching outside of the community to help people around Canada or into the U.S. or you know, even a call that I'm going to have with somebody later today from that lives in New York State, right? Uh -huh. They're, they search, seeked me out because of social media and the posts that I have. I need to be, give more exposure to myself in regards to uh, who and what I do in my city. So, you know, check out things like meetups, do what Rosemary was talking about, check out with the city clerk. I imagine we have the same sort of opportunities within our city as well. So, Thank you for that advice. Oh, you're very welcome. So, Rosemary, if you had to give our listeners one last closing message, what would you tell them in regards to giving a heck and never giving up? And one of the toughest questions that I seems to draw uh, an emotional response sometimes from my coaching clients is, uh, what do you want? 
I want you to feel that. What do you want? What do you want your life to look like? What do you want to experience in your life? Because life is short. Stop worrying so much and answer the question and then let's take action. How do you, you're going to get from point A to point B. But what people don't realize is the point B is just another experience or something else for you to, again, create that point A to point B, that you never stop growing. You never stop evolving. And you shouldn't. That life is short. Change is inevitable. But growth is a choice. Oh, so you want to enjoy your life. Keep challenging yourself, keep enjoying yourself, and be honest with yourself. Oh, yeah. Every single day, people are lying to themselves. And when it regards to personal development, people are like, when are you going to stop doing that? <laughs> Till the day I take my last breath, I'm going to personally develop myself. Well, you're never satisfied. You're right. I'm not. <laughs> I want to, there's always somebody that can teach me something. It, it, once I think I've arrived, now all of a sudden, people listening, when you think you've arrived, your brain also thinks it's arrived and your brain is a giant computer. It needs it needs input constantly. And if you don't give your brain input, you become stagnant. You start letting your emotional baggage can, can start to collapse about, um, amongst you or pardon me, on top of you. You can have all the little problems of your family and all the little problems of the world of what's going on with war or politics will start to crush you. But the more you feed your brain good positive thoughts throughout your whole life, the more it appreciates it. You don't realize it. And you create yourself a defensive uh, posture where you keep out negativity more often. You learn to live a more purposeful day. So, you know, I love that. You need to continually move forward. Never stop. Never stop giving a heck about your life and live, wanting to live a purposeful life forever. Because why would you want to learn how to live a purposeful life ever want to give that up? Ever. It's I know true I don't. freedom. Yeah, it's it is. true freedom. Nobody can take away my take away what I've developed between my six inches between my ears. They they can't do that unless I allow them to. The outside circumstances and noise of politics, family, all the other negativity that can come in, it it it, it is a hard time entering because I've created myself again a defense against it called positivity, and I do that through constant personal growth, personal development talking to fantastic people like Rosemary gives me uh, a continued hope, right? I understand that things can change because there's people out there that are, are road warriors. They're going to make sure that in this case, that women specifically, yes, I know you can, your men can definitely benefit from what you have to teach, but you're, you're out there making a difference. Even at your, you know, even at your young age, you're still out there <laughs> giving her, right? Still out yeah. there giving her. Most people just sit back and are camped and they're playing. And again, this isn't pick on people. You're playing checkers or going to the park to feed the birds, right? That's well, great. That's asked. great. You can do that. You can do that, but you need to also continue to always want to better yourself and better your community. Absolutely. I was asked, you know, you retired from urban planning, but why haven't you stopped? And my response is, you've learned so much over a lifetime. And there's someone that could benefit from that knowledge. How dare you die without changing someone else's life? There's someone that you can truly help. And that and they're going to help their children. It's going to change generations. So why sit on that knowledge? Share it because that's what you've been given. That's the skill set you develop. That's the school of hard knocks you went through. And the whole point is to give it away. Give that knowledge away. Do not die with all these experiences in you. Yeah. I tell people all the time, I continue to do it because I don't want the music to die with inside of me. And and they'll go, what do you mean? Well, I worked all this all my life to get where I'm at. 
And now I literally, I, I have that, that song, I have that excitement, I have that music in me that I need to share. It's not necessarily a, I'm going to pick up a guitar and start playing and singing to you. <laughs> but I, I say similar, similar things to people all the time. I just, one more, what happens if I can help one more person? And, and energy you feed off. So when I help a client and I see their joy and like this teacher I helped recently and, this, and the smile on her face and the confidence that she feels better about the fact that she knows she can effectively hit retirement. We figured out her goals and we still have some more work to do, but already I see changes within her. I feed off that. I get, I get the, I get the feel good. I get the, you know, the warm and fuzzies and <laughs> people <laughs> chuckle about that, but I do. If you are a good person out serving others, that energy they get off by, they give off part of me by you doing the right things and bettering their lives satiates you. At least it does for me. Yeah. Makes a, a life worth living. Absolutely. Any other last comments before we wrap up the show? I want to um, give your listeners a free masterclass sure. on uh, how to evaluate a neighborhood or neighborhoods that you're looking at, the things that you may overlook. So it's from the perspective of an urban planner, short, sweet, uh, but you'll never look at a city differently. After this, you'll start to just be aware of everything you're looking at. Okay. And where, where where's the best way for them to reach you or to find out about this? They can certainly follow me on Instagram under Rosemary Medell, uh, Facebook. They can reach out there, but certainly my website at rosemarymedell.com. And uh, they can sign up for through Calendly, uh, just a 30 minute chat. If it's about real estate, it's about just uh, coaching, um, high performance, or just to get some uh, advice and help them through their day. Happy to have that chat. Fantastic. I'll make sure that that goes into the show notes for listeners new to the show. Go to giveaheck.com, go into the podcast part of the portal, and you will see Rosemary's picture. And below that, you will find the abbreviated show notes. I'll make sure that the Instagram, Facebook profile in there, as long as access to the website so that you can reach out and uh, learn more. And Never, never forget purposeful living takes some effort. So get out of your comfort zone. Reach out to Rosemary. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Dwight. You're it's welcome. A pleasure. Yeah, it's been my pleasure as well. So thanks so much for being on Give a Heck, Rosemary. I appreciate your time and sharing some of your experiences so that others too can learn. It is never too late to give a heck. Thank you for taking time out of your day and listening to Give a Heck. If you find value, I'd appreciate you sharing with your friends and family so they too can learn how to live life on purpose, not by accident. So you do not miss the next episode. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and please also post a review. I look forward to reading your comments. This has been Dwight Heck. If you want to check out other podcast episodes or today's show notes, please check out my website, giveaheck.com and until next time together let us all strive to give a heck